On February 28, 2022, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest report. This is part two of their sixth assessment report, and this portion focused on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. This is incredibly important, as the IPCC has previously established human-caused greenhouse gas emissions have already increased the global average temperature by more than one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And due to ongoing emissions, we can expect the Earth to continue to warm. The question now is, what impact is this having around the globe? How are people around the globe vulnerable to these changes? And who is most vulnerable and why? Also, how do we adapt? Climate change isn't a future threat. It's happening now. This report looks into 127 key climate risks and how to reduce those risks and even prevent the worst outcomes and adapt to everything else. So what is climate risk? Well, to determine this, the IPCC looks at two questions. How likely is it that climate-induced disaster will happen? And how impactful is that disaster on those affected? We know from the latest IPCC report that natural disasters increase in severity and likelihood as the world warms, which means that the probability of a climate-induced disaster has already increased a lot due to human-caused global warming. That probability is only going to increase in the future. But climate change does not affect everyone equally. This report further underlines the incredibly uneven impacts of climate change, how it varies drastically by region, socioeconomic inequities, health inequities, and governance. Centuries of colonialism, racism, greed, and nativism have left certain communities around the world extremely vulnerable to any kind of disaster, let alone a natural disaster rarely seen on a century or even millennium timescale. The report states that 3.3 to 3.6 billion people live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change. Understanding the climate risk analysis, it's clear you can't truly address the climate crisis without first helping these vulnerable communities. This report highlights the damage that climate change has already wrought on the mental and physical health and safety of people around the globe. Last year in North America, climate worsened heat waves in the Pacific Northwest led to the deaths of over 1,000 people, resulting in the deadliest single natural disaster in that region's history. The report states that food and waterborne diseases and zoonotic diseases have increased as a result of global warming and will continue to increase as the planet warms. Increased exposure to wildfire smoke, atmospheric dust, allergens, and particulate matter from the burning of fossil fuels has left many with compromised immune systems, has led to adverse pregnancy outcomes, and has damaged respiratory and cardiovascular systems, making exposure to new disease more deadly which has been especially harmful during the COVID-19 pandemic. This report, for the first time in IPCC history, also looks at the mental health toll that climate change is having on people afraid of their own health and future, as well as the health and future of loved ones. Changing weather patterns increase stress and uncertainty. People are now suffering and dying from climate change. Projections in this report state that those risks all increase as temperatures continue to rise. But the level of risk will depend on our choices now. The IPCC notes that we have options to increase our healthcare investments to deliver better outcomes, build out more robust healthcare infrastructure to meet the needs of today, and make communities more resilient to the impacts of climate change they are likely to endure. And mitigation, Almost all mitigation efforts, like stopping the burning of fossil fuels, have benefits for health. Just the savings in health costs alone more than pay for the mitigation efforts needed to decrease risk and preserve human health and well-being. The IPCC notes the massive, unequal impacts to our food systems around the globe. Across the planet, we are seeing decreasing yields of essential crops as well as damages to our livestock, production, and fisheries. We are witnessing compounding risks to food systems and increased food safety problems. For instance, as the report notes, 
risks to health and food production will be made more severe from the interaction of sudden food production losses from heat and drought, exacerbated by heat-induced labor productivity losses. These interacting impacts will increase food prices, reduce household incomes, and lead to health risks of malnutrition and climate-related mortality with no or low levels of adaptation, especially in tropical regions. Additionally, impacts like unavoidable sea level rise will result in flooding and damages to coastal infrastructure that threaten food production and vulnerable agricultural communities and limit access to healthy food and safe drinking water. Overall, there are impacts on food security affecting millions in the most vulnerable regions, and this will only increase in the near future. Compounding this issue, the increases in food prices and malnutrition will be coupled with increased risk to the threat of climate-sensitive foodborne illnesses in the food we are able to produce. The more rapid we can mitigate, the less the severe impacts will be. But currently, the IPCC notes that there are not transformative actions being taken to preserve food systems and production delivering a fundamental threat to our way of life. We have to both mitigate climate change and adapt to it. For too long, mitigation efforts and adaptation efforts have fought each other for a share of a small but growing budget to combat climate change. The traditional view is that mitigation efforts, the stuff that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and helps prevent more warming and climate change, are for investments now that will bring long-term benefits that might not be observed for decades or even longer. Adaptation efforts have been focused on short-term solutions, such as building new levees or seawalls to protect cities from the impacts of worsening hurricanes and rising sea levels. But this report suggests a different approach, one that integrates both mitigation and adaptation in a way that brings transformational change rather than iterative progress. This more holistic approach is called climate resilient development, and its importance is a main takeaway from this report. Deploying more distributed renewable energy is a great example of climate resilient development because it achieves both mitigation and adaptation. By generating more clean electricity, we reduce the need for the burning of fossil fuels, which reduces the amount of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere. Mitigation. And by generating that power locally, if there is a major disaster such as a hurricane or a tornado, disruptions in the electricity grid will be minimized because there is less reliance on a centralized power source and a completely functional grid. Adaptation. But the report stresses that we must commit to climate resilient development quickly. The more the planet warms, the harder and less effective climate resilient development becomes. This report suggests that this threshold is 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial levels. We know from the 2021 IPCC report that the world is expected to hit 1.5 degrees, regardless of what we do now, by mid-century. So that means that the window for climate resilient development is closing fast and may remain closed forever if we don't act quickly and at a sufficient scale. But not all adaptation measures are good. There have been some examples of maladaptation that have actually worsened our ability to mitigate and adapt to the worst impacts of climate change. An example highlighted in this report is the use of seawalls. While seawalls do protect coastal communities from rising seas in the short term, they can result in lock-in, meaning those communities become more and more reliant on building higher and higher seawalls. And when extreme storms push water up and over those seawalls, those seawalls actually keep the water from flowing back out to sea as it should, which can worsen coastal erosion and prolong the impacts of coastal flooding to towns and ecosystems. This report states that seawalls, like other maladaptation measures, focus on sectors and risks in isolation and on their short-term risks and benefits. To avoid such maladaptation, decision makers must have a more comprehensive, inclusive, and long-term view of climate risks specific to local communities and ecosystems. The authors of this report recommend listening to and including indigenous people and in adaptation solutions, not only because indigenous communities are often the most susceptible to climate-related disasters, 
but also because indigenous communities have over centuries developed critical expertise of land and water management, specific to the unique qualities and vulnerabilities of those regions. That's why, for the first time in IPCC history, every chapter includes input from and focus on indigenous people. Climate change can increase faster than expected if we hit tipping points, causing certain feedback loops to be triggered. Feedback loops are the concept that warming the planet will actually cause some areas of the planet to increase their emissions of carbon dioxide, which then further warms the planet, which then causes those same areas to emit even more carbon dioxide, which then further warms the planet. So we're stuck in this ever-worsening cycle of increased warming and increased emissions. Not fun. One of the scarier points of this report is that Earth's most carbon-intensive natural ecosystems are also some of the most vulnerable to severe impacts related to a warming planet. Wildfires in the Amazon, the drying of peatlands, and the thawing of permafrost are all weakened by climate change. And since each of these are currently critical carbon sinks, Damage or even decimation of such areas would lead to irreversible changes to our planet and a disastrous rate of warming. As this report highlights, there are some limits to adaptation, some of which can be overcome. The report describes environmental limits to adaptation as hard limits. These hard limits can't be overcome and will be met more quickly as the world continues to warm. Hard limits have already been met in some warm water coral reefs, coastal wetlands, rainforests, and polar ecosystems. Soft limits are related to a lack of finance, governance, and political will. While awareness of the climate crisis has increased thanks to activist groups, academics, and educators, there's still a huge gap in money available for adaptation. Part of that gap is due to what we mentioned earlier. Historically, most climate money has gone to mitigate climate change rather than adapt to it. We've got to do both. A much larger cause of the funding gap is that money promised by developed countries to help developing countries is not only insufficient, but those promises aren't even being met. The estimated cost of adaptation for developing countries is $127 billion per year by 2030. Back in 2009, rich countries attending COP15 in Copenhagen promised a combined $100 billion in climate funding, but that amount has never been met in the 12 years in which it has been promised. Climate change has already caused a tremendous deal of loss and damages around the globe. And because there are some hard limits to adaptation, adaptation and mitigation alone cannot prevent all future losses and damages. In low-lying coastal communities, hurricanes and sea level rise will continue to cause harm and the poorest and most vulnerable communities will be hit the hardest and have the fewest resources to respond. As the IPCC continues to note, keeping warming from exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels is critical to prevent greater losses and damages and making large parts of the world uninhabitable. But as losses of human life and livelihoods, as well as damages to the most vulnerable communities that have been the least responsible for climate change continue to occur, it is critical that global leaders provide financing to account for these losses and damages now. This report indicates that integrating climate adaptation into social protection programs is one of the most effective uses of funds to reduce climate risks. These investments in social programs can coincide with sustainable development goals, such as improving education, alleviating poverty, and increasing food security, while also helping local communities adapt to the impacts of a warming world. Remember that climate risk is a function of both the probability of climate-related disasters and the impact of that disaster on a given community. Achieving those sustainable development goals will actually improve that community's resilience to such disasters, therefore reducing their climate risk. When it comes to combating climate change, this report is clear. Every decision matters. We have real choices when it comes to the future of this planet. 
and we have massive changes to make if we want to mitigate the worst damages, adapt to the ways our climate is already changing, and center justice so our solutions and funding decisions are guided by the most vulnerable communities around the globe with the greatest knowledge of local solutions and local adaptation efforts. And we begin to repair the losses and damages that have already occurred to the best of our ability. What matters now is what comes next.